the special that my wife was singing there to, uh, with the choir to rescue a sinner like me. And then again, this song that uh, we just got, this last special, is talking about the Lord. He gave us the word what to do. Heaven is real. Yes. Hell is real. Yes. Many times in Africa, I would preach in the open air. And when I did, I'd use a lot of practical African uh, illustrations. I said, how many of you ever been around when they boil the oil and they throw in some dough and they make galettes or gateaux as they would call them and the oil would splatter. How many of you have ever been burned by splattering oil? Well, pretty much all the Africans had experienced that and I said, how would you like to take some, somebody to take your head and push you down into that boiling oil? Well, I could just see the look on everybody's face. Sometimes we'd have like a thousand people. I'd go out to a street corner and start and then the crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The Lord gave us a lot of opportunities to preach in the open air. And so as I was preaching that one particular day, talking about that, I saw the shock on the people's face, but then I said, hell is hotter than that. And there's no remedy once you're there and there's no getting out. A lot of times we talk like we believe that there's a hell, but in practice, we're like the Jehovah Witnesses. It's like we don't really believe that there is an eternal hell. Why did Jesus come to earth? Let's turn over to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now stay in this chapter because I have another verse I'm going to read in a moment here. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. He's the creator of the universe. He knows everything. He can do everything. We are sinners. The human race has fallen. We're all born in sin. We're all depraved, incapable of doing right until we're born again. Why would he want to come down to a bunch of rebellious people like that? I can't understand it. How many of you have ever been in a play? Okay, they handed you your script and you read it. Maybe you're a little nervous. Maybe you didn't really like the part. Well, then after a while, maybe you got into it a little bit. And you got pretty good at it. And you really felt the part. And then how would you like it if the director came and said, uh, can I see your script? Sure, it's great. I love it. And they hand you a new one. Would you like that? Well, that's just what happened to Jesus Christ. Almighty God, the angels serving and worshiping him, and God the Father gave him the script, you're going to go to earth. And you're going to live a perfect life. You're going to be abused. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be whipped. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be accused of all kinds of false things. Even though you love them, they're going to do this to you. How many like to have your script ripped up? Amen? Now, some of you have been going through some pretty hard things. You had a good, comfortable situation maybe, but then your script got ripped up. The message tonight basically is called, When God Tears Up the Script. And then in the conclusion, when I get to your script, I'm going to be showing some things as Christians and through our local church we ought to be doing for missions. Well, Jesus took the first step for missions, amen? He accepted with all his heart the will of the Father. And that's what I challenge you to do today. Find what God wants you to do, whether it's to go, to give, to pray to communicate, to be more involved in your local church here. What is it that God wants you to do? Jesus says, not my will, but thine be done. Was it tough for him? Yes. In the garden as he prayed, and as, as it was great drops of blood was mixed with his sweat, and he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. God's been stirring up the pot here, I believe, today. And when we have days like this, it makes us uncomfortable, amen? Because maybe you're anticipating God's in the midst of tearing up your script. And he's about to give you a new script, amen? Let's look in verse 14 of John chapter 1. And the word was made flesh. God came to earth with the pitiful human race. And even today... The, the world rejects him. After all these years, you'd think they hear about the love of God and what he did for us, that things would be different. It's not. It's getting darker and worse spiritually. You need to find where you fit in the whole scheme of things for God. You need to find out. You need to be submitted like Jesus Christ. He wants us to follow his steps. Amen? So, and the word was flesh 
and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He grew, and then the time had come, and they arrested him, and they beat him, they spit on him, they ripped his beard, they, they plowed his back, the Bible says. As they whipped, they ripped strips of flesh off of him. God Almighty accepted the script that God gave him. If God were to lead you to some country, would you accept that script? If God would have you to go to your neighbor, would you accept that script? Jesus did so much for us, the least we could do is tell our family, tell the people at work, to be faithful, we can be faithful to church, we can give so our church can get the gospel to others, amen? But the script wasn't over. When he was on the cross, he said it is finished. He was in the grave. He rose again. He got a new script. He's at the right hand of the Father. Amen? He's glorified. Sometimes the scripts aren't what we like it to be, but I'm going to tell you, the last script you get is going to be the best one. Amen? And the last script you get is going to depend on what you do with the scripts along your life. And all of you are going through some things. Some of you have maybe had a lost loved one die recently. And it's a really hard thing. And you wish you didn't have that script. I'm telling you, embrace the script that God's given you. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe, maybe you've got a health problem. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you had gone through recently. And maybe you're not fully recovered from it. You need to say, God, thank you. I trust you. The Son always loved the Father. Jesus Christ always loved the Father. He always trusted Him, amen? He always fully embraced God's will. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to look at Joseph, how that he had his script ripped up on several occasions, amen? Genesis chapter 37. And again, I hope you see yourself in this, and I hope you're asking God to show you what your script is now. I believe God's tearing a bunch of scripts up today. And he's been doing it over the last several days and weeks. And, and I'm praying that God will help you to be sensitive and obedient to whatever God wants you to do. Verse 2. Gen, gen, or, uh, 3. No, seven, uh, 2. We'll start in 2. Gen, uh, Genesis 37, verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So the first script of Joseph, the coat of many colors, and then in the verses, I'm not going to read all the scripture, but the dreams were coming in. Amen? <laughs> he dreamed about the sheaths were there, and uh, his was there, and his brothers were doing obeisance, bowing down. And then there was the... Um, can you, what was the other one? <laughs> the sun, moon, and stars. And his dad got pretty upset. And uh, the boys, they hated him. Look at verse 8. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. He was the favorite son. He had future ahead of him. There was going to be good business coming in. He was trusted by his father. He enjoyed the script. And I can imagine God maybe saying, Hey, Joseph, can I see your script? It's a good one, God. My father trusts me. He's got me doing all kinds of stuff here. Things are looking good, Amen. <laughs> Here's your new script. Uh, what's this, Lord? Well, let's look down to verse um, 18. Okay, the father had sent him to see how his brothers were doing. Verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Imagine Joseph, he could, if he could know what his script was going to be, which he didn't. He got surprised by it. But, Lord... Things are going good. I like that one better. If you knew, knew all what God had for you, you wouldn't want that script. If I remember when I first went forward to surrender to be a bus captain. If I knew I was going to end up in Africa, I would at that time I would have said, no way. I'm not doing it. Amen. But I took the first step of obedience. I knew God wanted me to start my service for him by getting involved in the bus ministry. You need to be involved in your local church. Amen. It's a step of obedience. And it'll be hard in some ways 
but not like what he's preparing for you for. And God's got a lot of stuff for every one of you, but he will equip you for it. Bob Jones Sr. was asked one time, explain how the will of God is. How can you know God's will? And he gave an interesting illustration. He said, it's like God puts you in the room, and it's a mess. You've got to fix and clean and get it all around. And all of a sudden, when you get everything in order, and not until then, he shows you another door. And as you go through that door, you enter in a room that's bigger and messier and busted up worse. But the skills you gain in the first place, you're able to use, and then you develop more, and you are able to get that room in order, and then and only then he'll show you the next door. God gives you script after script, room after room, and I don't know what he's ready to put some of you into, but you need to be faithful and trusting God right now. You ought to say, Lord, show me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Amen. Now, so it, it, he's only going to show you what he knows you can handle, amen? Because <laughs> if God showed me I'd had malaria 30 some odd times, I don't think I would have ever got, got on the plane, amen? <laughs> and the things that some of my, my wife's gone through, she's killed a lot of green mambas and black mambas and cobras and all that. And so I'd be out in the bush and she'd be holding the fort down with the kids, amen? They, they took her wisdom teeth out one time over there and they messed her up bad and she couldn't taste for a year. That was pre-COVID, amen? Uh, <laughs> that, that was... Um, was it B.C., before COVID, amen? But anyway, um, so I'm glad she, knew, she had a good taste before and knew how to cook, amen? <laughs> but anyway, uh, otherwise it would have tasted like my cooking probably. But anyway, uh, if we knew all the things, we probably wouldn't have accepted the script. But God is working in many of your hearts today. And he's been working on them. You've been going through some things. And you've been wondering why? Well, this is a culmination, perhaps, of many things God's been doing in your life. He's ready to show you what that next step is, maybe. But you need to be surrendered. So let's, let's continue to see Joseph's second step here, verse 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him that he, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty and there was no water. I wonder what was going through Joseph's mind right then. I didn't sign up for this. I was heading over here to obey my father. I was heading over here to, to see how my brothers are doing. I didn't know they were going to strip me of my coat, throw me in shame and abuse me and, and betray me. And then they yanked him out later when they saw the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, the, the Bible uh, in the two different passages said that. And they're coming through and they sold them and then the Midianites ended up selling them to Potiphar. He goes to Egypt. Talking about forced to be uh, going to another country, amen. Yeah. He got the new script, you're going to Egypt, amen. <laughs> different language, different food. Different culture, different gods. He could have got bitter. He could have said, I don't want this, but he embraced it. Another interesting thing, if, if you look into it, there was myrrh and different spices on that. Myrrh was brought to Jesus, amen, before Jesus went to Egypt. Kind of interesting thing there. I think if he was on the wagons with all that, he was pretty sweet smelling by the time he got down there, amen. A lot of these balms and things. And then myrrh speaks of death and embalmment a lot. But anyway, God had a different script for Joseph, and he enters into it, and it didn't look too good. He becomes a slave in Potiphar's house. Well, you know what he did? He embraced it, just like you need to do whatever God's leading you to do. He embraced it. He worked hard. He was honest. He had the right attitude. He loved God. He feared God. He obeyed God. He trusted God, and he got lifted up to number one in Pharaoh's house. And then maybe one day the Lord said, hey, Joseph, uh, can I see your script? It's a pretty good one, God. I'm sorry if I complained before. It's pretty good, amen? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. When you first get one of those new scripts, it's not what you think it was going to be, and you didn't like it, maybe you complained, but then you saw God knew what he was doing, amen? Okay, God, you've blessed. Potiphar's blessed. Everybody knows things are going great, and it's because of you, amen? What are you doing, Lord? Here's your new one. They're going to lie about me? <laughs> I'm going to get thrown into jail? They're not even going to listen to what I got to say? Amen? Would you like that next script? He went ahead. He was thrown into prison. And instead of complaining, what did he do? He worked. He was a servant. 
Right where he was, he was doing the best he could. He glorified God, amen? He didn't turn to the left. He didn't turn to the right. He didn't compromise. He lived for God Almighty, amen? That's what God's wanting for, from each and every one of us. Whatever ministry you're in, if it's, uh, you're a Sunday school teacher, you're a bus worker, maybe you're in the choir, whatever it is you're already involved in, you need to be totally faithful. And you ought to be saying, Lord, is there something on this script that you want me to do now? I could be doing better. I could pray for my class more. I could make more visits. I could go and make sure more people in their family hear the gospel. I could give more to missions. I could pray more. I could surrender and maybe even go to the foreign field. Amen? What script is it that God's giving you? Be sensitive. God wants you to do his will even more. How many want to do God's will? Amen? Amen. I mean, I want to do God. I could, if I could lift the other, I tried that before. It doesn't work. Amen? I want to do God's will. Amen? I'm all in. And sometimes it's not the most comfortable. I, I remember one time I had hepatitis. I was in the hospital for a week, and then I was in bed for two months. But on top of that, my wife's laying next to me. She, her, the, she was expecting our, our uh, fifth child, and the water sack was perforated three months in, and they said, you better stay in bed. So we're laying there looking at each other and uh, homeschooling Jeffrey. He was six years old at the time, and uh, uh, it wasn't the script we were looking for, amen? <laughs> but God worked us through all that, amen? We now have churches in six countries over there in Africa, and each of them have pastors, and God's working in that. But some of those things were not too desirable that we went through. But I wouldn't change it for anything, amen? I want to challenge you. I want you to find God's will for your life today, this week, this month, the next step, whatever it is. Well, eventually, after a while, maybe Joseph said, you know, I'm doing pretty good here. I'm going to try to change some things in this script. The butler's in here. Hey, when you go, he, and he interpreted the dreams. How many are familiar with this? With, with all the story, I don't, I don't, you, why don't you just read these chapters if you're not familiar and get the rest of the story, amen? So anyway, uh, when you have time, not right now, but um, anyway, so he tells the butler, hey, when you see Pharaoh, you know, tell him about me, amen? God says, you got two more years there, amen? Don't skip steps. God's timing is perfect. Don't you try to modify it and change it. You embrace it. You accept it. You do it for as long or as short of a time as God wants you to do it for. And so finally, at the age of 30, after 13 years of a bunch of unhappy scripts that became happy as he served God, trusting him, submitting, amen, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's not just a good song and good words. It's the truth, amen. So then they called him out, and uh, he could have said, uh, I'm stuck in here for two years. The butler did it, amen? No, God didn't want the butler to get involved in getting him out, amen? So he gets out, and he's lifted up, and he's at the right hand of Pharaoh. He's the number two man in the place. And you know what happened? A lot of people were saved to life uh, because of Joseph. He says to his brothers, you meant for evil, but God meant for good to save much people alive. It, Satan meant a lot of stuff for evil, but God the Father meant it for good when he sent Jesus to earth to save many people from hell. And whatever it is that God's got for you now, God means it for good. Amen? So now let's get to your script. We saw Jesus' script briefly. We saw Joseph's script. Now let's see what your script ought to be. You, first of all, you need to get one of the booklets. How many of you have already got one? It's got the, all the missionary things. If you... Okay, you need to get one of these missions booklets, amen? And you need to start praying daily, amen? You need to have family devotions, and you can pray for missionaries. You don't necessarily have to pray for everyone every time, but you ought to regularly be going through here praying for your missionaries. That's the first thing I recommend. Get this and pray. Get the prayer cards. And I'm sure many of you have many prayer cards over the years. Keep praying for them. You know, it's really heart-touching. There's people that come to me. I started deputation in 1985. I've got people that even within the last few months have said, Brother Jeff, I've been praying for you since 1985. They got the original prayer card when I was still single. Amen. It's, it's amazing my wife would ever uh, marry me, amen, putting up with me. <laughs> a lot of people say she's got to be a saint. If you're around me very long, you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, I'm a very punishing guy sometimes. I make a lot of puns. But anyway, um, and other things. But anyway, um, I've had people say, I have prayed for you for years. 
And there's many times that I really have sensed that God has been uh, doing something special. One time, uh, my wife said, the dog's out there, and uh, you hear it? There's a snake out there. I said, how can you tell by the dog bark there's a snake? Well, I'm a basset, so maybe she's picked up on some of my, uh, my, my howlings a bit. But anyway, so I run out there, and, it, and the dog was bouncing and darting all around, and I picked up this brick, and I'm looking where the dog was. There was nothing. There's a black mamba coiled in there. And he started sticking his head out, and I threw that down, and it creased the back of his head and killed it. I mean, I came that close of maybe not being here. Amen. And uh, then there was a time where um, the, uh, one of the uh, African men came and was talking to my wife said, the people in the neighborhood are asking about these guards you have. You don't have any guards. And then one of them asked me. They said, all the neighbors are talking about your guard. Everybody in the neighborhood was robbed except for us. Later, one of another missionary just 200 yards down the road, they broke in and they beat him. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that happened. Everybody got broken into except for us, and people were afraid of our guards. And then finally, after about the sixth preacher boy that came that was visiting my house, he said, they're all asking about it. I said, don't lie to them. But if they want to believe there's guards there, amen, <laughs> let them believe it, amen. I wonder, was it angels? I wonder, was it shadows? Was it... There was a street light that was there, and we had palm, coconut trees. Maybe it was a brand. I don't know what they saw, but they were convinced. God protected us. And many people were telling us around that time, they said, has anything specific happened to you lately? I said, what do you mean? Well, I just felt an extra burden to pray for you. Amen? Pray for the missionaries. One time uh, we're driving along. Carla was uh, my, my wife, she, Mrs. Bassett. She was at the house with Joanna. Joanna was younger at that, uh, just a little girl then. She had malaria. And another missionary invited us over. So we go over there, and I was going to not go at first because I didn't want to leave my wife and, and daughter, but we'd been planning for about a month to visit them. So we go, fellowship, we left, and you know, if you know me at all, you know, 10 o'clock, and we're heading out, and uh, I remember Pastor Clark said uh, years ago, you're the one that shut down the different establishments. <laughs> Do you remember? Because <laughs> if you, you know, before, he has shut the lights out, and I'm usually one of the last ones here. But anyway, and uh, I'm not talking to myself either. Uh, and when Brother Crease and I get together, it's really interesting. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so we leave, and I've got four of my children, just little kids, and we break down. The timing belt broke, and some of the lifters broke. And I'm thinking, oh, boy. And so we get out and say, kids, it's time to pray again. And we had things like this happen often, and so we're praying. And I'm thinking, I can't leave the kids with a car because this road's a bad road. Thieves coming up and down uh, in, in hijacked vehicles a lot of times and they'll steal cars, and it just wouldn't have been a good thing to left my kids there. But on the other hand, it was too far to walk with them to go back to the missionary's house. Well, we started praying, and the first headlights we see coming around the corner, I said, Lord, help not to be a thief. Help it to be somebody that can help us. Well, the car stops, and the, and the guy said, hey, I've got, I'll be back. i got to drop somebody off. He did. He came back about 10 minutes later, had a strap. He towed us back to the missionary's house. He says, do you need a mechanic? He's a mechanic. And so then um, I said, well, when, when can you come? He says, 7 in the morning. I said, fine. He comes. He had the exact motor like mine. He had worked for a German man, and the German man went back to Germany and left his vehicle, and now he's using it for parts, and it was the identical vehicle. He had all the parts. He had it fixed by noon, and I said, what, what does it cost? And I think it was like $70. I said, what about labor? What did everybody give? And so I ended up, I think I gave him uh, $10 to, to do all that. And... Anyway, later, two weeks later, the missionary says, man, I've asked all the mechanics. They said, every one of them said they would have had to have gone to him to get the motor and the parts. Amen? We didn't have triple A over there. We had triple pray. Amen? <laughs> People were praying for us in advance. God knew what was going to happen. God takes care of us. You need to pray for your missionaries for provision, for protection, for power, for purity. There's all kinds of temptations. We're all human beings. We need your prayers, amen? Yeah. So the first thing, make sure you have a powerful prayer life individually and then your whole family and then collectively at, as a church. Thursday night, we have a uh, uh, prayer meeting here and we usually show a video uh, presentation and we pray for missionaries as well as other things. Pray for your missionaries, amen? amen. So that's the first thing. All of us can do that. All of us can up that. Maybe God's going to rip up your script of your Sorry, prayer life, amen? We need to say, Lord, five minutes a week's not enough?
Just before eating isn't enough? <laughs> God needs to rip up some of our scripts when it comes to prayer. I mean, don't answer me, but I'm wondering how many of you even prayed 30 minutes this last week? You need to rip up the script on that one, amen? If you're not praying 30 minutes a week, uh, that's one of the reasons we're all in trouble. In missions, we need manpower, money, and materials, amen? Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he send forth laborers. On my prayer cards, my first original prayer cards for several terms, I put on there that verse. And, and some of the Africans noticed, they said, you have 20 men called to preach and these other missionaries can't even get one. And we believe it's because you're like a prophet. You know what you needed, amen? And I said, I didn't think about that, but I did know I need laborers, amen? Pray to the Lord of the harvest, and he will give them to you. This local church has produced many people in the ministry. My father-in-law, he was in the ministry for years. He's 81, and we've recently moved in together up north of Syracuse, and he's still preaching. In fact, last week, we went to where he preached. He preached at one, I preached there, and he came with me, and they said, can you come next Sunday? I said, no, but my father-in-law can, and he did. And he preached, and so a uh, couple weeks later, which is last Sunday, my wife and I, we went over there. He preached, three adults got saved, amen? My, what a blessing it must have been to him, his daughter, leading two ladies to the Lord, amen? And I got to lead the, the other guy to the Lord. He was just weeping, amen? What a blessing to see an 81-year-old man, bad knees, a lot of strokes. He says, I want to go out for the Lord, amen? We don't have enough laborers. When all the older ones go out to see, seeing what's going to happen, we need a bunch of you young folks to surrender to God. Amen? Amen. We need God to rip up the script of a bunch of us. The souls need you. Jesus left heaven. He could have been doing better things in some people's eyes. Amen? But he came down to do the best thing. Amen? What does God want you to do? You can pray. You can give. Amen? In the Garden of Eden, God said... You can eat from all these trees except for one. This is mine. Amen? And the same thing. Everything you have belongs to God. I did this in Bible college this week. I walked up to one of the students, and I'm not going to point out his name. Amen? But I just said, uh, whose coat is that? He said, and he, his name's on it, and he and said, oh, that belongs to so-and-so. And I said, oh, I can't remember all what I asked him, if it was his pen, his Bible, his glasses, whatever it might have been. And he, oh, mine, mine, mine. And he wasn't doing it in a wrong, selfish way. He was just... Matter of fact, I said, no, they all belong to God. Amen? And I've done this in a lot of different churches. Everything you have belongs to God. And God entrusts you, and everything is stewardship. Amen? Someday Jesus is coming back. Someday we're going to stand before the Lord. And someday we're going to give an account for our stewardship. So something we can do as, as uh, believers is be the steward with what he's given us. So in the garden, don't touch that. Now, I know there's debates about tithe and stuff. I believe the tithe is a biblical principle, amen? And I do believe even though we're in the New Testament, there are some principles Abraham knew to give 10% somehow, and so did Jacob. And it's the principle of this belongs to the Lord. And why did we get in trouble? Because Adam and Eve took what belonged to the Lord, amen? And we're suffering for it today. I don't want to take what belongs to the Lord. Now, when I was younger, I, I was given 20 and 30, 40, 50. I, I, I'm not a... Uh, count every little piece of grain. I was getting, by the time that I realized God wanted me to be a preacher, I was giving 50%. I'm not saying that to brag, I'm just giving you that illustration. I believe in free will giving. I believe in trusting God and just give. You can't outgive God because he's got a bigger shovel, amen? You give and give and give. Some people say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But God wants to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What God entrusts you with, he wants you to put into action. If you have a credit card and you don't activate it, what happens? Can you use it? How many ever used a card and they say, well, it's not activated? Has that ever happened to you? Well, whatever God gives you, you need to activate. Amen. <laughs> you need to use it for his honor and glory, and you're active and you're activating. Amen. And then you'll see you're in God's economy and God will act. Act and God will react. Amen. Give and it shall be given unto you. Draw an eye unto God, he'll draw an eye unto you. Whatever you sow, you shall also reap. So what you need to do is act, step out, and give. Give by faith. I remember the night that God revealed to me he wanted me to go to Africa as a missionary. I was a senior in Bible college. I was majoring in pastoral theology. I was um, three and a half months from graduating. 
And, and that first three and a half years in college, I said, God, unless you show me something different, I'm going to go back to New York State and start a church. And I went from 80 to 84. I graduated in 84. And so three and a half months before, I'm sitting up in the choir, and uh, Rick Martin, a missionary to the Philippines, was preaching, and uh, Dr. Vineyard was the pastor of the church where I was, and he said, um, you're going to meet this offering at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, I was planning on giving anyway. So I opened my wallet, and to my horror, all there was was a $20 bill. It was Sunday night. I'm not going to get paid till Friday. My fridge is on empty. My car's on empty. My stomach's on empty. And I'm thinking, Lord, what am I going to do? Why didn't you lead me to go to the 7-Eleven to get a pack of gun and break the 20? How many ever, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, the Lord does lead me in those ways, and usually I don't get in a bind like that, but I was in a bind. And man, God, it's your fault. Amen. Lord, why'd you let this happen to me? Well, God gave me a script that day, man. And, and then the thought came to me, it was as if the Lord was saying, if you can't trust me till Friday as a single student in Bible college, then what are you going to do when you get out there and you need to buy a bus or a building or you have a family, you need medicine or whatever, what are you going to do? I said, Lord, thank you. And I put that. Well, before that, as the basket was coming, I'm sweating and I'm thinking, I'm going to make change maybe. I was in the choir. And so I'm sitting up there. I'm transparent. <laughs> My wife sometimes says too much information. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's not time out. It's TMI. But anyway, uh, so I see the basket coming. I'm thinking, there is no way I can make change without somebody seeing me. So that's out. And I'm, and I'm praying. The pressure's on. <laughs> Lord, I don't want this script. I, mean, I didn't say that, but that's the way I was feeling. I want to give, but that's all I got. But that's the script God gave me, and I gave it. Well, I just felt a total peace. And it's not because I did that that God called me to go to Africa. He already was working. He allowed that to happen as part of the whole process. I needed to realize I can trust God no matter what. And that night, I, I knew, without, just like I know my name, I went forward, and I knew God wanted me to go to Africa as a missionary. I was broken. I was melted. I realized what my new script was. I was going to Ivory Coast, West Africa as a missionary. And that was January of 1984. Well, the next, I was janitor and, uh, well, I guess the, what do they call it, uh, environmental engineer, I guess, of our, uh, of our church. So I fixed the um, heater and the air conditioning, all this stuff, cleaned up the messes and emptied the trash. But one of my jobs was every morning before sunup, I had to go in front of the building and pick up all the trash. Because it was on a main road, and people drove by and through Kentucky Fried Chicken barrels and McDonald's wrappers and stuff and beer bottles, whatever. So I'm gathering the trash up, and lo and behold, there's a $5 bill. Amen? I'm glad Abraham Lincoln was out there that morning. Amen? <laughs> anyway, I said, thank you, Lord. Next day, after chapel, one of the students comes up to me. He says, Brother Jeff, you lent me $20 last year, and, and I want and to pay it back. I said, I don't remember doing that. You did. I said, no, it must have been something. Take it. Amen? Thank you, last 25, amen. Monday, Tuesday, God takes care of you. You can't outgive God. You need to give by faith. When God lays something on your heart, you trust and you obey. You let him give you the script, and giving is part of it. What does God want you to do through your local church from now on? Maybe you've not been given the way you should, amen? God says, uh, can I see your script? Here's your new script. Start fresh. Push reset today. Amen? What is it God wants you to do? You've not been witnessing. You've been afraid. It, COVID and, and all this. I have a great time during COVID. I, I stop at a rest area. I'm going through and there's some, there's an older, I say older couple. I'm 65 now. But anyway, they're, they're walking through. I don't know how old they were. They say, you look pretty, you look young for 65. I said, we found the fountain of youth in Africa. You think I look good? My wife's 85. Amen? And the, <laughs> She's not, amen, in case you might have not seen it. People say, how do you put up with this guy? But anyway, so we're walking along at a rest area, and, and they're wearing the mask. This is when I first out. I said, who was that masked man? He starts laughing. How, how many of you know the you know, Lone Ranger? They said, but anyway, um, uh, if I keep it up, I will be a Lone Ranger, amen. But anyway, uh, um, so then I walk in, and, and I start with a stone. I give him a track, amen. And then I'm inside, and they're loading the machine with the chips. I said, well, when the chips are down, I know who to come and see. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. And so I start with I said, and then he's a, he's a Christian. He's saved. He says, you know, what, what a blessing. A lot of times it's so hard. I get around people saying all kinds of other stuff. I just look forward. God's given me time and time again. You need to give God opportunities to, to give you divine appointments. It happens over and over in my life. I just see, they say, God's led you. I'll stop at a gas station. I'll start with somebody. 
and, and, and this other guy, he's from Binghamton, New York. He had his own rig, and he said, I really thank you for approaching me. He said, I'm a Christian, and I pray that God will cross my path with other Christians. Sometimes encouraging the brethren is what's needed. At these dark and, and evil times, it just reassures them. It gives them a landmark. There's, there's a God that cares for me. Amen? What does God want you to do in your script about witnessing to others and about writing to the missionaries? That's another thing you can do. You can write to them. You can communicate with them. See if their prayers, you read their prayer letter. You start praying for them. Write to them. They have email addresses. Well, not all of them. There's some of us that are still old school. No, I, I do have an email address, but there's some that it's a hard time for me to get hold of them. But I can eventually, but write and say, hey, how's it going? We were praying for your wife, or we were praying for your child, or whatever the situation is. Or there's problems with your visa. Communicate with the missionaries and find out how things are going. Sometimes you keep praying and praying and praying, and the thing's been solved for a year, amen? And I've been embarrassed sometimes to say, brother, uh, we've been praying for you about this. I said, oh, I should have put that in a prayer letter. Amen. <laughs> so you missionaries, that's to you, amen? Uh, God wants to tear you up on your script if you haven't been faithful to uh, respond when you get answers. Of course, maybe you're on deputation. Maybe you don't have all that uh, uh, to, to report on. I'm sure you do, though. So communicate with your missionaries. Um, the little children. I tie balloon animals. And uh, last night, uh, one of the missionary children, I well, for a couple of them, and then, uh, I made them balloons. So today one of them came up and hugged me. And then I'm sitting eating and they came up and hugged me again. That was special to that little child. I have five missionary children, my wife and I, and there's a lot of times where we go church to church and nobody paid any attention to them. We spend a lot of energy, time, and money here at the summit for the kids. Is that true? And there's a value in that. The kids are on board then with their parents more. They're on board saying we have a real God and independent Baptist isn't so crazy and wild after all. There's other kids just like us, amen? How many ever heard of that, amen? Love the missionary children that come through. Encourage them. So my kids said, one of my sons said to me after one church, that's only the second youth pastor that ever paid any attention to me. And we'd been in a lot of churches. That ought not to be, Amen. So, I mean, don't overdo it. Don't smother them, amen? But do care. Do show. Because if they feel like we're going along with mom and dad, nobody cares about us. And usually when you go from church to church, it's the parents that get most of the attention. We need to not forget the children, amen? I was at one missions conference, and there's another missionary that was talking about, you could just give $20. So they called my, family, my five kids up. They gave each of my five kids a $20 bill. And my kids will never forget that church or that missionary. Amen. <laughs> Dad, why didn't you ever say that? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Well, I, it wasn't in the script, I think. But anyway, anyway, so aren't you glad of the new one? But anyway, show care. Okay, we gave the basket, and we, there's different things that we do, but that's something as a church we can do. And a lot of times kids come through and they make buddies in the churches, and so maybe a pen pal. Um, mission trip. Okay, I'm hoping to make more missions trips back to Africa. I, mean, I was going four times a year, but then they started shutting the countries down. They were canceling. I had to get the money back from my tickets, and it's kind of brutal. And my wife's sitting there. She, she's a great help to me. And uh, over in Africa, they say, missionaries, uh, you have watches. We have time. Amen. So she reminds me that we're not in Africa. But anyway, um, um, mission trips, go to a foreign field. Now, when I say go to the foreign field, now, it's not just a simple mission trip. Does God want you? And I remember when I was sitting up there in the, in, in the choir that day, the missionary Rick Martin was saying, somebody needs to go to this country. Somebody needs to go to this country. And God just kept touching me about one of them. I said, Lord, maybe it's him over there. I knew there were several of my buddies that were surrendered to the mission field. Maybe it's him. Maybe it's him. And then Rick, uh, Brother Rick Martin said, why can't you go? And the Holy Spirit, why can't you go? <laughs> Amen. Lord, hear my send me. And it wasn't a spooky thing or anything. It was just... God was just simply helping me to understand what he already was planning me to do. What is it that God wants you to do? So there's the giving, there's the praying, there's the going, reaching. When I'm in Africa, I'm glad that you're reaching Berlin, New Jersey area, amen? Our churches in Africa can't reach here, but you can. So just as I want to be faithful to bring the gospel to where you send me, and these missionaries want to be faithful where you send them, we want you to be faithful to reach this area, amen? So your neighbors, 
I'm not, not going to meet some of your neighbors ever, and I'm not going to meet some of your family ever. So, um, in conclusion, we need to be like clay, how that the potter found that the clay was marred in his hand, and then he had to work again. How many ever ever worked with clay? Okay, when I, I used to... Uh, in, in junior high, I remember sometimes that we had art class, and you're pounding on it, and you're squeezing it, and you're rubbing it and rolling it, making it soft and pliable. Oh, there's a little hair there, there's a little grit there. And finally, you get it moldable and soft, and, and you can do something with it. Well, I remember I was a young Christian, I said, God, please use me. Basically, Lord, show me what this script is. Show me what it is. Help me to do what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And I begged him and I begged him, and it just didn't seem to be coming. Well, finally, it was, uh, boom, it was as if the thunder came. I said, what was that? I started having problems in my life. I started having all kinds of things. I said, Lord, I've never been so surrendered in my life. Anything that should be given up that I can think of is gone. Anything I ought to be doing, I'm doing. Why are these problems coming? And then the, the problem after problem, and, and God, as if God showed me, as I was reading the scriptures, he just brought to my heart, you want to be used, don't you? Yeah, I want to be used. But if you want to be used, you've got to be usable. And there's some things that are not usable in your life. I've got to break you and remake you. Lord, break me. Amen. And then he starts working on me. Oh, this has got to go. Doesn't have that, that in and of itself. No, if you want to be used, that's got to go. Amen. Even if it's not a blatant sin, there's some things that are distractions. Some things that are time wasters. I surrendered anything and everything I could think of. And then he puts me on the wheel. How many ever... Work the wheel. I mean, my wife had vertigo the other day, and she, how many ever had vertigo? Not a fun thing. And so I had spiritual vertigo. Lord, what's going on? Just answering your prayer. I didn't, have, you begged for this. Amen. Well, soon he had a vessel he could fill with his love, his power, his wisdom, his compassion. He could do something through. I was on board with him. I accepted the script that he gave me, and he's given me quite a few over the years. Amen. When Brother Charlie first contacted me about coming here, I said, I got a pretty good script right here. God says, no, I got another script for you. Amen? Amen. God knows what he wants you to do. What is it? Won't you do it? Are you praying the way you should? Won't you pray? Won't you give? Won't you witness more? Won't you say, Lord, here a mile ago, are you willing to be willing? Some are not even willing to be willing. And I'll close with this illustration. My wife, when she, five years before I met her, she was 16 years old, and she said, uh, Lord, she went for that invitation, I'll be what you want me to be, I'll do anything you want me to do, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, except Africa. <laughs> All right, she, was, she didn't want that script, amen? She was sort of preconceiving and planning on what she was going to want and not want. You let him give you the script. Don't you play with it, amen? He knows the best script for you. And then two weeks later, when she was still 16, she went forward, had another invitation. Leon Maurer was preaching, and she said, Lord, if you want me to go to Africa, that's the best place for me to go. I'm so glad she settled that as a teenager. Amen? Five years later, I met her. People say, was it love at first sight? I said, I don't know about that, but it was hope at first sight. Amen? <laughs> I told her, if her voice is bad, I'll, I'll fill in for it. She says, no, that's not an option. Amen? <laughs> so she can harmonize, I can harm your ears. But anyway... Um, <laughs> The Lord, I'm glad he gave me, the, I don't know if she likes the script so much, but I like the script. No, she, we went to Africa, and on the way over, I told her we might have to live in a mud hut, which I seriously meant. Because we I was thinking about maybe going back into the bush area. She says, but it doesn't have to be dirty. Amen? Now, is that a, that, that a missionary wife or what? Amen? I said, Lord, I got the right one. Amen? And for many, many, many reasons, I know I have the right one. But in conclusion here, what does God want you to do? What's the script? He's been tearing up your script. He's given you a new one. Maybe you're heartache and heart, heartbroken. God knows. Accept the script he's given you.